Okay, well, it's really my pleasure to give this uh, video conference presentation. And uh, I decided my title pretty late, so apologies uh, to Philip and everyone else who wanted to hear more about um, APIs. Uh, so I chose to talk just a little bit more general about integration of text mining in the digital library. So without further ado, um, let's start. So I think uh, earlier this morning, you saw a couple talks uh, from the No Center, Roman, uh, who's uh, very big into information extraction and uh, pulling out lots of different uh, types of information. And uh, we'll talk about more about this in the Science IE task. So uh, being able to identify nuggets of information. And uh, just before lunch, I think we also had a talk uh, about uh, from Jan about uh, bibliometric networks. So this is a, a slide that I stole off of the net. And uh, if you know me, uh, you know I like slides a lot. Slides are, are one of the my favorite types of academic materials. And um, so we can build bibliometric networks. And I think a lot of this workshop on the Excite workshop is going to be discussing about how to build bibliometric networks. So in general, uh, when we think about uh, Excite and uh, scientific articles, we have certain target problems that we are considering. So one is about managers, like uh, what do they do uh, when they think about scientific documents? So maybe I, I care about ranking institutions, or I want to find an expert who knows about deep learning, or I want to care about the impact factor of different things or altmetrics. But I also have the authors, right? And uh, we are scholars, we're quite conceited in some ways. So we, we look at, um, you know, citations, but also quite a number of other things, right? So being able to uh, find data citations, figure out what venues are the right ones to publish, um, even to do crowdsourcing or reproducibility of science. But I'd argue that a lot of what we do as uh, scientists are to help these two classes of people, managers and offers, but we're missing out somebody really important, and that is the readers, right? So if you have a postdoc or you have an undergraduate or uh, postgraduate student who's starting to do research, what are we doing to help them make more sense of the scholarly literature? So I teach a digital library class at NUS here, and uh, I ask the question, what is a digital library? And my students generally don't know. They think they know. And I think the answer that most people come up with, it's a database of PDF files for reading. And that's really sad, right? I mean, uh, after all, we are computer scientists, information professionals, and we shouldn't be letting the database discipline dictate what we can do with our scholarly literature, sort of locked up in PDF files, which we have been discussing for many years, right? So actually, the biggest marker of progress by people has been through other means. So librarians and end users have come up with lots of tools for citation management and sharing uh, citation and bibliographic data. And computer scientists have been thinking about the offers, you know, uh, looking at citations, uh, H index, G index, but we don't really support people reading the document, right? So uh, reading and annotating and furthering the scholarly document is a, a key issue that we need to deal with. So I gave a talk a while back in 2005 about um, an introspective digital library. The idea behind that is you have a digital library that can introspect its own contents, make sense of that data, and then go back and uh, annotate that data and build upon it. And so you hear all about all of these advances of AI building its own AI. I'd like to have a digital library that can build its own contents or annotate scholarly material or direct scholars in some way towards the right, uh, the right um, scientific advances that they could make. We're not anywhere close to that, uh, but that's the vision. And to get there, I think we need to have facilities that are going to mine scholarly data and then plow that right back into the digital library. Don't think of it as a standoff uh, resource that we would consume in a, a bake-off or a contest, but rather put it into the digital library so it can be acted upon. So 
I think of the process of research. What does it take? Uh, what are the life cycle of a scholarly document when you know a scholar uses it? So when I teach undergraduate students and, and they do uh, research with me, the first thing they have to deal with is the process of research. And they start with an enthusiasm. They're like, oh, I'm going to learn how to do science. That's cool. I'm going to contribute a scholarly paper. And then they have to go about discovering. And then at some point, there's just too many possibly related works because they don't know how to sift which keywords are important. So there's a bit of anxiety going on. Then you have to help them focus on uh, certain issues and drill down and actually read the article. So uh, I teach my students how to read uh, at the skimming level and then at the detailed level. And then finally doing comparisons, reporting and implementing their results, and then finally distilling it and communicating it as a part of a research article. And I think if we think about all of the different processes that students, scholars, research scientists do in the process of research, it's very interesting to think about what are the life cycles of, of what we need to support. So um, there's definitely different uh, types of information that we would do up here about discovering information. And then, again, very much different activities that we would do when we're uh, comparing, reporting the, um, the information. You know, all, at all times, we are accessing the digital library for different uh, functionalities. So I think of it as having this big hourglass shape where at the beginning and at the end, we're uh, looking at a lot of different materials, not just one scholarly article, but at the, at the core of it, when we're doing the comparison and reporting, there's only a very small number of scientific documents that we need to study in depth. So I think as a professor, we teach research as an apprenticeship. So all of the same types of uh, stages that we do are also present in uh, what we ask our students to do, as we saw on the last slide. So there's mastery by searching for documents, reading them or skimming them, then writing those documents, listening to questions about those documents, and uh, presenting just like I'm doing now and then doing something with that and creating and teaching other people, disseminating that information out to others. Okay, so if we think about this entire uh, life cycle of a scholarly document and how it relates to other scholarly documents that you know you might need to compare against, then I think for the readers there's quite a lot of different functionalities that we need. Right. We need annotations and labeling. We need to be able to create actionable metadata extraction, what uh, Roman talked about earlier. Um, being able to understand what's the function of a citation instead of just counting them. Uh, be able to understand the sentiment of a citation. And also to understand where the ideas come from. So sometimes an idea doesn't come from a source document. It comes from a document that precedes the source and tracing the provenance is important. And as I told you before, I really like presentations. I tell many of my beginning students when they're working in an area, maybe a picture really is worth at least a hundred words. Why don't you uh, go find um, a file type uh, PDF or PPT, uh, find a presentation that discusses it and read that at a high level first. So uh, I'm very interested in this uh, other idea of presentation to document alignment, where we take the scholarly th document and the slides that present it, just like the ones that I'm doing now, and then try to align them together because I think both types of uh, scholarly literature, both the published form and the uh, uh, unpublished, uh, unofficial slide versions of it are very, very useful artifacts of our scholarly life. And to get there, I think we, we're still not quite at this part. I've done research on all of these. And if you're interested in ha knowing more, you can come back to this link over here, uh, which talks more about this than what I have time for. But I think we're at the stage where we're laying groundwork. 
And I think throughout this uh, workshop, we've heard a number of talks, and we are going to hear a couple more uh, about the groundwork towards that. So my group has uh, definitely worked on the groundwork. Uh, we created a system called Parsite, which I think a number of uh, us in the audience also have used or have compared with. Um, it has a number of different functions that we've been manufacturing as part of this toolkit for a number of years. Um, it's been down for a couple of months and now it's uh, recently been resurrected, but it's still a little bit uh, under the weather, so I, I won't give a demo today. Uh, but it has uh, some of the reference string parsing that you'll hear from the Sermine talk later, right after this talk, um, as well as other things. So it can do uh, offer affiliation matching and try to determine generic section headers. I think this is a, a really important artifact, this one here, because it allows us to uh, be able to zone the document into different areas. So for example, I would like to know what are the method sections, what are the evaluation sections, what is the introduction and uh, related work sections, because they all have different rhetorical function. And if I can refer back to the slide earlier where I was talking about the process of research, each of those components has a specific use in the life cycle of a researcher, right? So we use related work in certain areas. And when we get to implementation, we care about exactly the methods, exactly the setting of the parameters, what types of evaluation measures that we use that we might uh, mine information from. So uh, supporting uh, something like the zoning of a document into generic sections, I think is really critical towards enabling that. Some news that uh, we have uh, is the fact that pretty much everyone under the sun is going after deep learning and uh, we're no different than that. So we've created a version of Parsight that uses a, a CRF model that uh, goes over a bi-directional long short-term memory uh, neural network. Um, this is currently under review, uh, but uh, we got good results. Um, you will be able to see down here that uh, the performance at the micro level is not that big. It is a small improvement. But at the macro average, at least for many of the minority classes, there's a fairly big improvement of about uh, 2 to 3%, which is significant when the, the performance is already pretty high, as, as we know from other talks on reference string parsing. So uh, we hope to uh, put this into a Docker container so that other uh, users can go uh, install uh, uh, the container on their software and, and try it out with uh, and use it as a reference benchmark for comparison. So I think we're all at this ground stage where we're trying to get access to the scholarly document and it's encumbered in many ways by the PDF and uh, we've heard many talks about how to get information out of the PDF and I think Kave Bazagan uh, made a very good point in his uh, conference talk a while back to say that you know publishers should be really just giving us the XML and then letting the researchers and the scholars mess around with that wherever possible. And I actually happen to be in a position to do something about this. Um, uh, and what we'd like to be able to do is to take a task like the science information extraction task which is a semi-val task this past year, where we're trying to extract information out of uh, documents. Right? So this was a shared task. I'm sure many of you have discussed this. But if you don't know about it, it's very simple. Uh, there are some key questions that we want to ask. So um, machine reading a scientific article, we want to identify three particular pieces of information, tasks, processes, and materials where a task and a process have some type of hierarchical relationship with each other, okay? And be able to put this into a system that can identify keywords and type them with these three classifications uh, so that we can advance science in some way, in, in some automated manner, right? So we could ask questions like, which papers have addressed um, the problem of science information extraction using variants of, you know, I don't know, supervised learning or something like that, where, where those keywords would uh, take over the, ta uh, the placeholders of task and process. 
And uh, we've done work on this too uh, for medicine. So you can think about this as uh, the first step towards making something like the structured as abstract, right? So in, in medicine, we have information about the patient, the interventions, um, the side effects, and the outcomes. So all, three, all four of these elements are very important um, to extract from a, a medical document, um, which is usually actually not present in an abstract. Right, the abstract tells you about the scientific advances, but a, a practitioner wants to know whether that particular intervention or, or medication is useful for the patients that are in their ward, right? Not, not just in general. So I said earlier, I'm in a position to do something about this. So I happen to be the uh, steward for the ACL anthology. The ACL is the Association of Computational Linguistics. It is an open access proceedings, uh, not encumbered by copyright. That was a decision made long time ago by the ACL. And uh, this compiles really the top venues in uh, computational linguistics and natural language processing. And there are about 40,000 proceedings um, in this library, which is growing at about 10% per year. So it's a fairly large digital library that I have to take care of. And so let's take a look at what we might do with this test bed. So one thing we want to do is make uh, things like human and machine readable annotations available. So here we have a system um, in the ACL anthology, and I can give you the links in the Slack chat later, uh, where you can um, try to find machine readable H, uh, sorry, XHTML versions of the scholarly text. And later when we put in Parsite and Sermine uh, extraction, you would be able to find machine readable annotations of all of those different systems uh, attached to a scientific paper right on the scientific paper itself. So we can envision all of these different types of layers of annotation being contributed to uh, by third parties um, that would include uh, things like what we normally do, like a reference and uh, citation network information, but also keywords um, that are could be structured abstracts as well as multimodal alignments. Let's say, for example, you have a presentation and a scholarly paper aligning those two in some way. So here we have a particular uh, paper of interest. I, I think you know these gentlemen, right? Okay, so I picked their paper on purpose. So uh, let's say uh, we want to know more about what they did with Nazer Ne uh, to, to make a, a, a generalized language model. And I can go read the paper, right? I can follow the link um, in the title and, and get to the PDF. But maybe I'm interested in, you know, turning loose, uh, you know, a Roman's uh, information extraction system on it. And then having those results appear uh, right here. Well, we can do that, right? We can have uh, other systems like Sermine or, or Parsite uh, contribute machine-readable formats, MRFs, and have those... Uh, advertised directly in the digital library, right? We can also ingest attachments, right? And this actually works in the current ACL anthology. We have links to presentations directly on the data set uh, so that you can um, look through uh, uh, presentations as well as posters uh, from events and links to data sets and software. And uh, you can imagine that there can be a uh, more detailed uh, ingestion. So this particular screenshot here is from the ACL Anthology Network uh, hosted by University of Michigan. And those keywords are, are of course, uh, sized appropriately to the types of uh, keywords that are in this paper. Okay, so if we can build all of these models into the system. We can also think about, okay, these are machine readable layers they should be, be able to be consumed by other machines to uh, create additional annotations, right? So maybe we can look at trans or uh, build uh, more reliable information extraction by using previous uh, information extraction technologies and an ensemble method. And all of that would be plowed back into the digital library to, uh, so that it can be uh, made better and better every time. 
So how does this work? I'll uh, very basically say how it works. Basically, we take an XML record where the anthology has an ID for a paper as an anchor. And you can offer contents in certain ways. You can offer content in terms of uh, specific uh, natural language content, or you can embed uh, some type of URL so that it will be displayed directly in the ACL anthology as an embed or an iframe so that you can link to a third party service. So we envision this as a, something to go forward and I welcome your comments on this, that digital libraries really should be a, um, a hub, right, for where new data can be found. So when uh, new proceedings are ingested, um, for example, I think the uh, European chapter of ACL is happening very soon. I have the proceedings that I need to ingest for the anthology. When that becomes online, that should be advertised by RSS. And then other endpoints, third-party endpoints at uh, Trier, DBLP, or wherever else in the world, at maybe even at Excite, would pull that data and um, work on the data through uh, pulling down the PDFs or pulling down other machine-readable layers and then um, advertising what type of information they're going to make. So then the digital library itself, the ACL anthology, would then pull this type of data from this third-party endpoint when it becomes available through some schema, right, or, or some RSS feed. And then it can be directly embedded or used, um, hosted on the anthology uh, for further use and scholars' use. Okay, so I know we're out of time, so I just want to finish with this last slide to say that I think there are lots of really challenging things ahead, but I think we are part of the way there in the sense that we have a lot of groundwork laid by many different groups in recovering clean data, and it's really exciting to see it at this time where we have so many different systems going into play. And I think we're right here in the sense uh, we're at enabling technology. We're building uh, search and management systems and offering tools for the scholar. Uh, we haven't really touched on this topic very much where we want to support uh, scholars to write and disseminate articles. Um, so that's probably a talk for another day. But then uh, many of us are interested in insight to help forecast or predict where funding should go. And I think uh, that's a very interesting part. So with that, I'd like to conclude, you know, our goal at Wing in NUS in Singapore is to ex expedite scholarly communication. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much.